A continuación, como, como comentaba Xavier, eh, vamos a dar paso y vamos a hacer la palabra a James Steinberg. En realidad, eh, gobernanza tiene mucho que ver con, con globalización, ¿no? Y gobernanza, al final, eh, yo creo que es un, un eufemismo optimista eh, ante lo que significa la falta de gobierno, ¿no? Eh, los estados han dejado muchas veces de tener eh, poder y autonomía suficiente para conformar la sociedad. Eh, los centros de decisión en muchas ocasiones se han trasladado a ámbitos internacionales y la gobernanza de alguna manera pretende analizar cómo se canaliza ahora la, la política ¿no? y cómo se, se articula al final las decisiones eh, colectivas. En este sentido, para, para nosotros es un placer contar con James Steinberg, en, en esta nueva configuración y en esta nueva arquitectura institucional a nivel mundial, eh, los Estados Unidos han tenido un papel hegemónico eh, y el señor Steinberg, como subsecretario de la entonces secretaria de Estado y actual candidata Hillary Clinton, ha vivido en primera fila y ha tenido eh, una implicación eh, personal eh, interesante en lo que significa la nueva, la nueva construcción de, del orden internacional y de la gobernanza internacional. Así que no me alargo más y le cedo la palabra. It's a pleasure for us to, to have you here and to present you and to, to learn from you. And uh, go ahead. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's a great privilege and honor to be here and uh, so pleased to see so many people participating in this very uh, timely and relevant summer course. I want to thank the, uh, the chief counselor, the deputy chief, the president of the university, and all those involved in organizing uh, these discussions. Uh, you've hit on a very excellent set of topics with a great um, set of panelists. And we've already heard uh, this morning some very, very thoughtful um, observations about both the nature of the challenge and some of the opportunities and strategies for moving forward to deal with uh, collaborative governance. Uh, in my remarks this morning, I want to make a few general observations following on uh, the remarks of, uh, of uh, my colleagues, but then, as you've suggested, focus on the international dimension, because I think there are some both unique challenges and opportunities about collaborative governance on the international level, and since that's where I have spent most of my recent career, uh, uh, I'd like to share those insights. Uh, for me, this is especially timely because uh, through my career, I've uh, lived in two worlds, one the more academic and analytic world and one in the world of practice. And uh, now, it, as uh, just recently stepped down as dean at the Maxwell School and a teacher at the Maxwell School, uh, this is a, a set of topics and issues which is very timely and important to us. Some of our leading scholars and experts, including our new current dean, um, David Van Slyke, who's one of the leading uh, experts in the world on public-private partnerships, Tina Nabachi, a faculty, senior faculty member, uh, senior professor, uh, who's worked on collaborative governance and, and participatory democracy and so many others. So I'm privileged to work on the academic side uh, uh, addressing these issues that you're discussing, but also in my own experience. I think it's also important to recognize at the outset that the issue and the, the, the questions around the potential and value of collaborative governance are not new. I'm also a historian as well as a, a practitioner. And for Americans, uh, the issue of collaborative governance is deeply rooted in our own history. Uh, for those of us who n know our history, uh, it was really during the, the early days of the settlements in the United States of the colonists in which the idea of participatory democracy and collaborative governance really had its roots. And as somebody who grew up in New England, the experience of the town hall and the idea of citizens deliberating uh, directly uh, over their fate uh, is something that, that is, has a long history and, and strong resonance uh, in our time. And uh, one of the great observers of America, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, who came to the United States during the early days of our republic and observed that one of the unique features of our society was the strong role of civil society and a recognition that much of the power and the success of our social cohesion and our ability to meet the challenges uh, of the new world came not from government, which was very much mistrusted even in those days, uh, because of our experience uh, as a colony, uh, but the strength of uh, civil society, which de Tocqueville uh, saw and described in his great work, Democracy in America. 
And so uh, this is something that we have long understood as part of the strength of our democracy beyond uh, its formal uh, institutional mechanisms and uh, the sense that uh, our, our public life is more than just the life of the public institutions. It's also, uh, for me, it's been a very important set of issues because my own uh, personal career has intersected with the issue of collaborative governance in many different ways. Uh, one of the first jobs that I had uh, when I was still a student at university um, was uh, in the late 1960s um, during the period uh, of the Great Society, um, a period of, of great change and ferment uh, in America where uh, the uh, recognition that the, we had a lot of catching up to do in terms of the provision of public goods and dealing with some of the social challenges in our society of uh, race and of poverty uh, and discrimination and the like. And some of the important uh, great society programs uh, were focused around uh, an effort uh, called the Office of Economic Opportunity. And what was unique about the programs at the time in the great society was a recognition that citizen participation needed to be built into the, uh, the strategies for delivering goods. It couldn't just be Washington coming up with the ideas. And so as a, a young 18-year-old, I went to work for a community action program in Boston, Massachusetts, my hometown, in which citizens themselves became uh, partners with government in designing programs. Um, for those of you who know this, and there probably aren't many here, but one of the great uh, uh, American public figures and a, and a former professor at the Maxwell School, um, Daniel Moynihan, uh, studied this in, in later years. And uh, it, it uh, although well-intentioned, uh, Moynihan came to the conclusion that this approach to citizen participation was uh, a deep uh, failure. That it, uh, on the one hand, raised expectations about the responsiveness of government, and yet far from producing effective solutions, actually produced tension, gridlock, and controversy. I'm not sure I fully agree with Moynihan's conclusions, but it was a period in which there was a great deal of attention to participatory government and collaborative governance, but it became somewhat discredited in the United States. And it took a period of time uh, for us to come back to the idea that we needed to revisit that. Um, but a second set of uh, personal uh, uh, interactions with the idea of collaborative governance came at the next phase of my career, when uh, in the mid-1980s, uh, I, uh, along with a number of uh, international NGOs, participated uh, in the 1985 Nonproliferation Treaty Review Conference. Now, this seems somewhat arcane, and I know few of you are probably very focused on uh, the NPT, but what was unique about this was uh, it was a very early effort in the context of the UN system to try to find a way to involve civil society in the uh, discussions and collab elaboration of uh, international uh, policy and international legal regimes. And so, um, uh, along with a number of, of NGOs, I was uh, at this time a fellow at a think tank in London, uh, came and were invited to uh, the Grand Palace in Geneva, where all these great gatherings take place, and kind of reminded you of you know, the great days of the Congress of Vienna and, and the great days of diplomats, as you talked about it, the way. And, uh, and so we came and we had our credentials, uh, which said that we were official observers. Uh, and uh, we got into the, the entrance to the room and they said, well, you go sit over there in the ante room. Um, and they said, no, no, we said, no, we're observers in this meeting. They said, well, we don't really quite know what to do with you here. We know you're invited, uh, but you can listen. Um, uh, and, uh, and so throughout the proceedings, we tried to find ways to participate in the conference, but because these traditional diplomats had had no experience with the, um, the engagement of civil society, uh, I don't think it was uh, in bad faith. There was simply no mechanism, no experience, no uh, way of thinking about what this meant. After all, at the end of the day, these negotiations were taking place among states and votes had to take place among delegations of states. And so you had this kind of uh, odd participant who uh, the international community understood somehow had a voice that needed to be heard in these discussions, and yet no mechanisms had yet been developed uh, to do that. And so as we came into the 1990s, we saw uh, that there was a growing awareness of the need to engage uh, voices outside the public sector 
in debates ranging from the very local, my experience with the community action programs, to the very global nonproliferation, which is as global an issue as it came. But yet the mechanisms and the strategies for involving citizens, civil society, business, uh, and other sectors uh, were very poorly developed, uh, that we still uh, lived in a world in which there was a, a broad and sharp division between the public and the non-public, uh, and uh, uh, the way, an understanding that there was something missing in the current in, uh, structures, a lack of institutions or mechanisms uh, to, to address that. And uh, although it, this inchoate sense of uh, need for something different uh, has been a long-standing one, I think as our uh, earlier speakers uh, have suggested, um, the, the urgency and the, 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 the centrality of this question, I think, has become much clearer in recent years. And Javier has given us a very good uh, explanation about the, the kinds of factors that we face today that have led to uh, a sense that the, the current formal institutions of governance are not doing a good job under either of the two key headings in which we think about what governance should be about, that is legitimacy and efficacy. That we see our institutions failing on both scores, a sense that our publics no longer believe that they are effectively represented by formal institutions at any level, local, state, national, or international. But also a sense that not only are they not people not being heard, but these institutions are not delivering the goods, and they are not uh, producing the results that people expect and need if they're going to con uh, continue to um, command public support. And so what do we see today? We see on the one hand, as again, Javier has, uh, has very well described, a deeply dis disaffected citizenry. And this is uh, not unique to uh, this region or this country or this continent. Uh, the issue of citizen disaffectiveness uh, uh, is, uh, is an international one. It affects both developed and developing countries. You certainly see it in my country. I don't need to say any more about that. It's pretty evident. Uh, you see it in the debates here in Europe, in the experience with Brexit, in the, uh, the questioning of the, uh, the, the role and the, the, the legitimacy of the European institutions. But you also see it in developing countries, just reading the headlines today about the developments in Brazil, for example, is yet another example uh, of where we see this, this crisis of legitimacy and efficacy playing out. You see it in China. You see it really around the world. And so there is this deep sense that the institutions no longer uh, represent their citizens and no longer effectively deliver goods. And the, the, it's compounded by the challenges of globalization. We've talked about here the sense in which the institutions that we have are no longer matched up with the, the forces and the issues that we need to deal with, that the big issues of our time, whether they're economic, whether they're climate, whether it's migration, whether it's health, whether it's energy, are transboundary uh, challenges that require new kinds of institutions to try to address them. There's also a, a new set of challenges, a new set of strains on the system by the need to accommodate diversity that our institutions in the past tended to reflect the views of, uh, even though formally democratic, tend to reflect the views of the elites, the well-privileged and the like, and a recognition that there are many, many voices uh, which have not been heard yet need to be heard if our institutions are to be both legitimate and effective. A sense of declining social capital, the great strengths that de Tocqueville talked about uh, in the 19th century in America being eroded by uh, modern society, by technology, uh, the, 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 the kind of vision of my good friend Bob Putnam of Americans bowling alone, uh, a sense that we don't have the kind of alternative structures uh, to provide a sense of inclusion, of social cohesion, of belonging, um, and uh, of course the, uh, the, the lack of confidence in public officials, uh, issues like corruption, uh, the role of money in politics, and the like, all basically undermining the kind of formal institutions that we have. And so, although the issue of participation, of inclusion, of, of, of collaborative governance are longstanding, I think the, the forces that we see today have put the issue in a much more urgent uh, and challenging way, uh, and that both to sustain support 
for governance and to meet these very complex new challenges that we face, we simply have to find new models and new approaches. And we've heard uh, in a very compelling way this morning some of the, the strategies that are being pursued here on a local and regional level. Um, but I want to focus now on uh, how these play out on the international level because uh, there are some unique challenges um, that require very imaginative thinking and where the, the formal institutions of governance, of particularly of democratic governments, are very difficult to adapt to the global level. Um, we still live uh, in a Westphalian system, uh, but there's a clear recognition that on the international level, whether it's within the UN system or within regional institutions, that the idea that governance can be done by states on the model of sovereign equality and one state, one vote, as nominally enshrined in the UN Charter, is simply unconvincing to anyone. Uh, it's not a model that either has any particularly compelling legitimacy, nor, as we've seen from the rather ineffective responses of our global international institutions uh, to issues ranging from climate to uh, infectious disease uh, to uh, uh, civil conflict, uh, to war, to human rights, uh, that these formal institutions on the, the international and transnational level are simply not developing either the capacity or the, the confidence of our people in doing it. And again, we see this in the crisis in the EU and the, uh, the inability of uh, our global public institutions like the UN and its associated agencies to really come up to, to meet the challenges and, and develop the confidence uh, of our people. Uh, in part because of the, the incredible uh, complexity of the problems, in part because of the diversity of the constituencies, these formal institutions, while necessary, are simply not going to be able to mobilize public support and resources and capacity to meet the challenges of our time. And so, as we've watched uh, over the last 20 years or so, what we're seeing is a lot of creativity outside the formal institutions of international governance to try to meet uh, these problems. Uh, you look at this, and I'm going to talk about a few uh, very specific examples about how civil society, the private sector, and the like have come to try to begin to think about new ways uh, to deal with um, international issues. One of the intriguing, one of the earliest ones, I think, has been broadly in the field of human rights and human empowerment. If you think about um, the, the formal mechanisms of uh, human rights on the international level are both the uh, international uh, legal documents, the uh, UN Declaration on Human Rights, the Associated Treaty on Political and Civil Rights and Economic and Social Rights. But I think few would conclude that those formal treaty mechanisms have been a very powerful force in actually promoting uh, human rights uh, and individual rights around the world. Similarly, the formal mechanisms, the UN Human Rights Council, although playing a role in providing some kind of forum for discussion, uh, is a place where because governments control it, they're able to short circuit the discussions, to provide uh, blockages against actually dealing candidly and forthrightly among the issues uh, to actually see the realization of uh, the rights that, um, that are nominally protected by these formal institutions. So where's the progress been made? Well, the progress has been made by mechanisms where the private sector, NGOs, uh, uh, business, and others have come together to recognize that only by working together uh, in a collaborative structure can we see progress. And two of the most dramatic examples which I've had the privilege of being involved in were first in dealing with the problem of apartheid in South Africa through the Sullivan Principles in which uh, groups from churches, civil society, and the business community began to develop a set of codes and principles uh, for protecting uh, against discrimination in South Africa in the workplace, which had a powerful effect then on the public institutions. And similarly, in a parallel way, the McBride principles in Northern Ireland, where, again, uh, the, the public institutions had made little progress in dealing with discrimination against uh, religious groups, religious minorities uh, in Northern Ireland, and, and opened the way to a broader uh, social dialogue. In both of those cases, the efforts, the collaborative efforts of civil society and business then opened the door to a broader political discussion, which in both cases have led to the changes that we've seen. 
although things are not perfect in either South Africa nor Northern Ireland, this engagement of civil society, including business and religious groups, uh, NGOs and the like, were I think essential to prod governments and the, pu and the public sector to begin uh, to deal with these issues. But we see it across the board on these issues. The, the reason today that we have uh, an international criminal court and a set of principles around uh, uh, international responsibility is not simply from the formal mechanisms of uh, uh, international law, uh, the Convention on Genocide and the like, but rather the efforts of civil society to uh, prod states to move forward on the Rome Treaty and create the new kinds of institutions to deal with this critical question now of the responsibility to protect and the responsibility of governments to meet their needs. You see this in the, uh, the Landmines Treaty, again, an example of where the public uh, institutions themselves, the UN, the Security Council, were not able uh, to mobilize around a very compelling human rights issue, but because of the efforts of civil society and others, we have a new approach which is now then being incorporated into public institutions. So that's a powerful example of where global governance and collaborative governments engaging the private sector has provided the impetus, the initiative, and the, and the ability to break through the blockages of the formal institutions. A second powerful area is the area of global public health. Uh, as we all know, the, the crisis uh, of AIDS and of communicable diseases was one which was a, uh, a real blot on the international consciousness uh, as we went from the 1980s to the 1990s and the inability of the formal mechanisms uh, of our national governments and international institutions, including the World Health Organization, uh, in the face of what it was a, a global academic of just extraordinary proportions. And it was only through the mobilization of uh, civil society through the uh, UN AIDS initiative, but largely outside the, the formal UN mechanisms that brought together the business community again, uh, uh, civil society, uh, international foundations, the Gates foundations and others that not only uh, raise the consciousness around these issues, but actually mobilize the resources and bringing together the private sector when the international public sector had failed to do it and governments and the UN formal agencies ultimately came on board. But had it not been for the engagement of civil society, of the private sector and others, uh, we would simply not have made the kinds of progress uh, that we have made today. It's, it's too little, it's too late, but uh, one only uh, hesitates to think where would we, we would be without those levels of engagement. Similarly, as we watch the Ebola crisis emerge, uh, over the past uh, several years in, in West Africa, uh, the slow response of formal institutions uh, required the prodding of, of groups like Médecins Sans Frontières and others in civil society uh, really to, to overcome the bureaucratic inertia and the limitations of formal public institutions. Um, and we see this uh, again uh, in, in a number of other fora. Uh, we've seen, for example, in the area of international trade uh, the, the way in which the formal institutions of the WTO system have largely been seen by our publics to fail to meet uh, the larger needs of, of, of society and a, a growing recognition among governments that unless both the business community and civil society, workers, NGOs and the like, are brought into the process and actually brought into the green room rather than left outside, uh, as we had in my experience uh, earlier in the, in the 1980s, are we ever going to generate the kind of public support for needed steps in, in terms of uh, increasing uh, global economic activity that is seen to benefit all and is seen both in its substance to benefit all, but also in its process to benefit all. And so issues around transparency and inclusion, critical. Uh, we're still at early stages in terms of how that needs to be done. But there's certainly a recognition both at the national level and I think at the global level that the kind of the, the, the states by themselves trying to do these deals in secret, uh, in private and without engaging the public uh, simply will no longer um, be effective. We see this more broadly in development policy and in the evolution of the UNDP strategy for development and the recognition now at the core of the national plans that are required to be developed under the UNDP framework uh, for inclusion and engagement now much more focused on process and, and participation rather than on the, the kind of the formalities of the outcomes and a recognition that, that you won't get good substantive outcomes unless you have a process 
uh, which is uh, inclusive um, and engagement. We see this obviously in peace processes and uh, I mentioned the cases of, of uh, South Africa and, and, and Northern Ireland. We see this in the <laughs> Balkans and elsewhere that without bringing civil society directly into these negotiations, uh, we are simply not going to be able to develop durable uh, and sustainable uh, strategies to do this. So we are beginning to see the evolution of new, more hybrid approaches, which recognizes that there is a role for public international institutions, but th to deal with these complex challenges and to develop the support of society in favor of these solutions, that, that the inclusion, the idea of participation, and meaningful participation has to be central. So how has this played out from the perspective of the United States government, which is where I want to end on this? Um, I don't mean this to sound like a campaign commercial, but I, um, I had the privilege of, of working for uh, Secretary Clinton uh, during the first part of the Obama administration. And one of the hallmark achievements and initiatives uh, from President Obama and, and Secretary Clinton was what has been called the Global Partnership Initiative. And I want to just take a minute or two to talk about that because I think it reflects a perspective on this idea of, of governance um, which has now, I think, begun to uh, take hold in our bureaucracy and hopefully uh, be a catalyst on the international stage. Um, uh, it's both bureaucratic in the sense that the Secretary has created an Office of Global Partnerships uh, in the State Department who reports directly to the Secretary and therefore has an influential voice. But I want to uh, take a minute to uh, read to you the, the description of the, 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 the mechanism and the objectives of the Office of Global Partnerships. Uh, which is focused on public-private partnerships uh, at the global level. And so this is the, the definition, I'm going to quote it. Um, uh, a private-public private -public partnership is a collaborative working relationship with external partners to the United States government, such as businesses, financial institutions, entrepreneurs, investors, nonprofits, universities, philanthropists, and foundations, in which the goals structure and governance, as well as roles and responsibilities, are mutually determined and decision-making is shared. PPPs, that is the public partnerships, are, dis are distinct from traditional contractual arrangements, such as grants, cooperative agreements, and contracts, in that they are rooted in co-creation, co-design, and co-resource mobilization toward a shared and mutually beneficial objective. Further, public-private partnerships are characterized by jointly defined objectives and collaborative program implementation. Successful partnerships entail complementary equities, transparency, mutual benefit, shared risks and rewards, and accountability. And the reason I take the time to read this is that there are a lot of words in here which I think are really critical touchstones as we think about the design of new approaches going forward. Uh, I, you heard them, you heard them, several of them repeated, but they include the, the, obviously the focus on shared, but also on mutual, a recognition, and we heard this in our earlier discussion, that, that the solutions require some awareness that there are, that there are multiple objectives, that, that they're not everyone shares the same goals, and that there needs to be a sense of mutuality and complementarity in developing these strategies, else we will never get anywhere. That, that a sense that these cannot be win-lose solutions, but find the ways of, of compromise, of finding common ground and the like. So mutual benefit, mutual reward are really critical to the, uh, the, the context in which um, this mechanism needs to be uh, moved forward. And it's obviously something that we heard in listening to the strategies being pursued here at the local and regional level is obviously much more challenging at a bigger level, at a national and global level, but it's nonetheless uh, essential. The idea of co-creation, co-design, co-resource, a sense of ownership uh, of the, the mechanisms themselves so that it is not simply a consultation or seeking the opinions of others, but actual meaningful engagement uh, in the process. And of course, the key and most difficult of these co-decision, right? Which is to try to find mechanisms for actually not only talking about these things and seeking the perspectives of others, but actually to have some sense of ownership and to develop the mechanisms that leads one to feel ownership. 
recognizing that, that not everybody is going to always agree with the results and that there's simply, one can't sort of count on unanimity as the, uh, as the strategy for going forward. Um, so both mechanisms and, and culture and context, I think, are critical to developing these new hybrid approaches. Um, this, as I say, is enormously challenging uh, in a, as you get to levels of scale because here, as you sit around uh, uh, and you know each other and you can, you can have the sense of recognizing the, kind of the, the individual mutual respect, how do we develop this uh, at, uh, at an international level? How do we cultivate this where the kind of face-to-face -face personal engagement, the local culture is not there? I think this is really uh, a, a place where there, the idea of uh, collective governance actually requires us to think not just about the formal mechanisms, but also to think about how we, we prepare our next generations to provide leadership here. And this is why I'm so pleased that the universities are part of this, because I think not only are we trying to develop kind of the, the models and the mechanisms that we can study, but it's actually every bit as much trying to cultivate new ways of thinking in new generations. I, I confess, having been in this for most of my career, that it's for those of us who've come out of more traditional worlds of governance, even at the local level, as you suggested, or political parties or political institutions, uh, we can uh, talk the talk, but can we learn to actually do this in practice? And I think part of it is that we need to begin to inculcate these practices at a much earlier age. And the role of universities and educational institutions in beginning to help people not only read about these things, but begin to experience and practice them at early stages. And so. My final observation is that, that my current role is one of teacher. And one of the things that I've learned is that what we need to do is begin in our educational experiences to actually begin to, to take that perspective into the classroom as we begin to engage with our students, to give them the experiences of developing the idea of co-decision, co-mobilization, to understand what it means to work in a context of diversity to try to bring together all voices and to try to develop strategies that will lead to this idea of collaborative governance that gives a sense of legitimacy that can be effective and sense of inclusion but not paralysis in terms of the mechanisms and to recognize that these are not um, issues that can be solved in one day but if we don't engage uh, the full range of our citizens with all their talents and expertise, then we will simply have no chance of addressing these really complex and, and critical challenges of our future. So thanks very much for your attention.